Often my videos are only focused on one pot, such as a vase, bowl or a teapot. So in this video, I want to show you what it's like when I produce much larger batches of work. And in this case, that's just over 100 espresso cups. And beyond just throwing, trimming and handling them, I'll be talking about how I dry them in between all those stages so the clay is in the right condition to work with. And controlling that is almost just as much a skill as all the other steps. So I begin by weighing out 105 lumps of soft stoneware clay, each weighing 150 grams, which is about 5.3 ounces. After being weighed out, I very quickly wedge two balls at a time. And really this process is just to amalgamate all the pieces of weighed out clay to bring together each lump and to form a nice round shape. As throwing all of these will take about four or five hours, I place the clay onto a plastic sheet and I'll keep them partly wrapped and I'll occasionally lightly spray them with water just to keep the lumps of clay soft, which is especially important in the summer months. As I throw these with such soft clay, they centre easily. Once spinning true, I use my index finger and thumb to make a well in the centre and form the base in one movement. And you can see how throughout that process, my ring finger and little finger on my left hand keep the piece of clay controlled from the outside. Next, I can begin lifting the clay up to the throwing gauge's rubber pointer, which I've set to the predetermined measurements for these cups. And to make sure each cup is exactly the same, I throw the walls of the pot so the rim comes to rest just beside that pointer. If I go a bit too high, I can compress the lip back down, or even slice a portion away with a sharp potter's needle. A bit of excess clay is then removed from around the base, and any excess water or slip from inside the pot is then removed with a sponge on a stick. I then position a sharp metal kidney beside the pot, and I push the clay from the inside out against this straight edge, which leaves me with a much neater surface, and one that isn't covered in slip. The sharp lip is then softened slightly with a chamois leather, the pointer flicked out of the way and a taut, twisted metal wire is dragged underneath. To my left I keep this plastic bucket which has a sharp rim and I scrape all the slip off my hands against it, which means when I go to pick the pot off the wheel there's no slip on my hands or on the pot and this makes lifting them away and placing them down neatly much easier. Although it's worth noting that if you're using very smooth clay that contains absolutely no grog, it can be quite tricky to remove pots like this, as the clay will want to stick to your hands no matter what. Once a wear board's full, it's taken away from beside my wheel and put on the workbench, and from this point I'm already thinking about their drying. As these have such thin walls, I don't place them in the sun or somewhere where there's a strong draught, as if they dry too quickly or on one side only, the pots can potentially warp or deform, which would make all of the processes hereafter, such as the trimming, more difficult than it need be. When making larger batches of work like this, the pots you started with, compared to the ones you end with, will be quite different in terms of their consistency, as the first board of cups will have already been drying for a few hours or so, and as soon as the rims of the pots are firm enough for them to be flipped over, I do so as the bottoms of pots always take a bit longer to dry out. Now, as I don't have a damp cupboard to store these pots in overnight, I instead use kiln props, a big piece of polystyrene, and a few sheets of plastic to create a makeshift tent of sorts. This way all the pots can dry slowly overnight. If it was the dead of winter and it was cold and damp, I may leave them uncovered overnight. But recently it's been warm and my kilns have been firing, so I'd rather not take the risk and I cover them thoroughly like this. They will dry somewhat, even when covered like this, but I'd prefer to be present as they dry, so I can flip and move them around as needs be, so I'm the one in control of their drying. The following morning, the first thing I do is unwrap these. And I'll check each cup, flipping them onto their rims, if the rim is firm enough to take it. If the clay is still too soft and you try and flip them, the rims can be squashed and the wood on the wearboard can imprint itself into the clay. As for the wearboards I place the cups onto, when they're flipped onto their rims, they're always placed onto wearboards that have been washed clean, as I don't want any scraps of clay to embed themselves into the rims that I carefully finished, as correcting all those tiny errors can add a considerable amount of time to the creation of these. 
This is now the end of that following day and the cups still aren't quite firm enough to be trimmed. So once again I'll store them overnight on a plastic lined wearboard which just keeps them from drying out too much as they're left unattended overnight. Finally, two days after being thrown, these cups are ready to trim and they're more or less the same consistency of leather hard from top to bottom. And it's worth noting that while these were drying, I was doing plenty of other jobs, like glazing, trimming, and throwing even more pots. I'll turn these cups using a specially made chuck, which I keep leather hard, wrapped in plastic, in this tightly sealed box. I prefer using leather hard chucks, as I find, once wetted a little bit, they stick to the pots quite well which generally just makes for a slightly smoother experience when turning work. These espresso cups, which are basically just mini versions of my normal mugs, are being made as a limited edition run to be given as gifts in conjunction with the launch of my book in September. For those of you who don't know, it's called By My Hands, A Potter's Apprenticeship. It's a story about my life and learning a craft. I write about the pots that were important to me in my development as a potter, together with talking about some of my philosophies on the craft, and all of that is accompanied by photographs to help illustrate almost 10 years of learning. And I'll leave many more details and a pre-order link down in the description below. Anyway, for these cups, and for any future limited edition runs of pots that relate to my book, I made various simple book stamps to go alongside my normal maker's mark. And after firing all these porcelain stamps I made, this was the first real test to see how well they transferred into the clay. Now for the trimming itself, I first attach the chuck down with a bit of slip brushed onto the base of it. It's then tap centered into the middle of the wheel and the friction combined with the slip quickly drying causes the chuck to stick in place very firmly. I then bring the first board of leather hard cups over and I make sure to start with the driest cups first, leaving those that are slightly soft on the workbench to dry out further as I turn these. Each cup is placed atop the chuck, they're tap centered, and then I push them down firmly. I then place a spinner on top of the cup through which I can push down firmly, pinning the pot down in place as it's turned. If you attempt to do this whilst the clay is still too soft, the rims of your cups will splay outwards as they're pushed over the conical chuck, which you don't really want to happen, as if these cups have flared rims, they become something else entirely. I trim the walls a little bit to make the cups lighter, and then I scrape them clean with this metal kidney, which gives me a lovely flat surface and removes the worst of any trimming marks. I then remove the spinner, but I'm still applying downward pressure with my fingertips whilst I trim a beveled edge around the outside of the pot. I then trim over the base, flattening it and removing any of the wiring off marks that were left over from when the piece was taken off the wheel. And then once flattened, I use either a metal or a plastic kidney to burnish over the clay on the base. And finally, the pot is stamped with my maker's mark and the little book stamp to the right. Then just before taking the pot off the wheel, I push the cup down firmly while spinning it. This ensures that the rim is nice and round. But again, if you try this when the pots are too soft, the opening will likely just deform. Once a board is full of trim cups, I'll once again wrap them up in plastic, as I don't want these to dry out any further as the remaining cups are trimmed. I tend to use kiln props to hold the plastic at either end to keep them all tightly sealed. I then put down a new board and line it with plastic, ready for the next batch of trimmed cups. And I try to get rid of any major wrinkles in this, as they can occasionally mark the pots that are placed onto them. As I had so many to trim, it took me a few hours, which means I wouldn't have enough time in the day to attach and pull their handles too. So once again, they're all wrapped up really thoroughly. And as I was leaving them over the weekend, I even sprayed them lightly with some water. When attaching and pulling handles to pots, they need to be the perfect condition. If they're too soft, the process of joining the handle onto the cup will cause the cup to deform. And if the cups are too firm, and are bordering on being bone dry in certain places, then the attached soft handles will very likely crack as they dry, as both components are just too different in terms of how dry they are. To keep my chucks leather hard for months on end, or years even in some cases, after each use, I soak them in water and then wrap them up very tightly in plastic before storing it away in its box.
As I was leaving these cups over the weekend, I covered them in a second layer of plastic too, as there's no way I wanted to risk them drying out too much. It's now handling day, and as the cups have been sitting wrapped up for so long, I hope they'll be the perfect condition of leather hard to have their handles attached. But once again, before I can begin pulling, I first prepare my workstation, and I'll be placing the newly handled cups onto this wearboard lined with plastic, as like you might have guessed, after this, they once again need to dry out very slowly. What are you doing up there? As for the clay used for the handles, I want my stoneware to be not too soft and not too firm. If it's too soft, you run the risk of the handles sagging after they've been pulled, as the clay isn't strong enough to hold its shape. On the other hand, if the clay is too firm, then you'll have a more difficult time actually stretching the clay out nicely, and there's a greater chance that you'll simply rip the handles off the cups. I pat my lump of clay into a longish droplet shape. It doesn't need to be perfect, but by making it relatively long, you can make this beginning step of pulling just a bit easier, as stretching such a thick expanse of clay can be rather tricky. Essentially though, all I'm doing is wetting my right hand, which pinches towards the top of that lump of clay, and then whilst maintaining that pinch, I quickly run my hand down the length. As the strap of clay gets finer, I progressively pinch more and more to thin it out further, and I make sure that I'm pulling either side of the handle. This way it keeps a nice oval cross section. I then snip these blanks off against the sharp edge of a wearboard, or you can use the edge of your workbench. I make sure they're all roughly the same size, but as each of these is going to be attached to the espresso cups and then pulled again, they don't have to be perfect. Nor does it matter if they have fingerprints on them. But the one thing I don't want to do is indent these lengths. They need to remain as consistent as possible, so they're the same thickness, width, and length. I do most of the pulling over a basin of water. This helps keep mess to a minimum, but inevitably this process is quite messy, so I always keep a towel and a sponge on hand, just to keep my workstation and my hands tidy. I try to be quick with my movements. I don't pull slowly, as it's harder to retain the same pressure for a prolonged period of time as you pull down. If the length of clay becomes too dry, or your hand dries out, then one of the components will stick to the other, and the entire handle length will be torn away. So as soon as I feel like the handle's drying out just a bit, I'll dunk my hand back into the basin to wet the length, which helps it to flow neatly and evenly. Generally speaking, I always pull a few more than I need, as it's good to have a few extras if you do happen to ruin some. And I like using a wearboard to snip these off against, as I can just flip it around and use the other side of it too. You can, equally, use an extruder to do this step, but then you have a whole machine you have to clean out after each use. Whereas pulling handles like this produces very little mess, is quick, and if you do have handles to pull of another size and shape, you don't have to change any extruding die plates. Rather, you just alter the shape of your hand and produce blanks of a different size. And once again, as this process is going to take me a few hours, and I absolutely don't want these handle blanks to dry out too much, I'll place them onto a plastic lined bat, so the moisture in them isn't absorbed into the wooden wearboard underneath, as these blanks of clay tend to dry out very quickly. And it doesn't matter if they're piled up and touching, as each one will be attached to a vessel and pulled again, so this is in no way their final form. I'm often asked if I let these blanks dry out slightly before they're attached to the cups, and the short answer is no. When the clay is soft like this and easily malleable, they're incredibly easy to blend into the bodies of the cups, and they're easier to pull too. So ideally, I want them to stay at the consistency they are at this point for the entire day as I'm pulling. I'll even spray them with water if I feel like they're drying out too much. So here's the workstation. I have one board where I'll take the cups from, and next to that I have the plastic lined wearboard the handled cups will be placed onto. I score a small patch maybe a finger's width down from the rim, and then I dab a touch of slip onto that, which is just watered down clay. I take one of the handle blanks, hold it in my hand so one end protrudes slightly, and then I tap that down on either side to create a sort of flared end. And it can be pinched a bit, if needs be to move the clay into the right place. 
This means that when I blend the handle into the cup, I'm using material from the flared section and not from the actual length of the handle itself. I then push it firmly against the cup with my left hand inside to brace the opposite side of the wall as the clay is pushed onto it. I then blend the top join by firmly running my fingers over that flared section. I want it to be more or less flush the entire way around as this creates a really strong join and when I pull it next, there's less of a chance of the handle simply tearing off in my hand. Once attached, I can then pull the length a lot like I was doing earlier, only this time it needs to be much thinner and neater. And I make sure that I pull both the left and right side of the handle so that the profile of my hand, or more particularly, the groove between my index finger and thumb is run over either side of the handle. So it doesn't have overly sharp edges and it keeps a balanced oval cross section, which won't be the case if you only pull it from one side. I then use the tip of my thumb to pull in three distinct grooves on the back of the handle. This helps to thin it out further and removes just a bit of the mass from the top portion of the join. So it appears a bit more sleek and slender and consistent from top to bottom. Supporting the base of the handle, I then let it gently arc into place. I press it back firmly into the clay and snip away any excess. And then I use a wetted finger just to tidy up this bottom portion of the handle. That's one down, only 104 to go. Once a board has been filled up, I'll spray them lightly with water and then for the last time, I'll tightly wrap the pots up. It's the drying of these once they've been handled, which is the crucial bit. As the clay of the handle and the cup are of such differing consistencies, one being very firm and one being very soft, if I were to leave them unwrapped to dry out naturally, then they'd just dry unevenly and cracks would likely form around the joins of the handle. Whereas if I wrap them and spray them with water, the little enclosed atmosphere will be quite humid and it should cause all of the clay to sort of balance out in terms of consistency, meaning the handle and the cup will become the same. So I'll keep them wrapped up like this for a day or two so they can really acclimatize to each other. And only once that's happened, will I unwrap them and dry them out properly until they're bone dry and are ready to be bisque fired. After a long day on my feet, that's all the cups handled, save for nine others, but those are kept on another board as they would have ruined the symmetry here. The cups still aren't finished yet though, and there's still one very important final step to go. Throughout the handling process, as the cups are held and moved around, there's a chance that their bases will be slightly damaged or some of the clay from the handle will be smeared onto the base. So the following day, the espresso cups are unwrapped, as is the same chuck from before, which is slipped and attached to the wheel. And all I'm going to do for each is place them onto the wheel and tidy up their base. And this before and after shows the difference quite nicely. Here's what the base looks like before it's been cleaned up. And here's how they appear afterwards. It's the spot just underneath the handle which gets cleaned up the most. But the difference this makes is huge as they look quite messy before and this final bit of quality control goes an awfully long way. They're placed atop the chuck and are centered carefully as to not accidentally whack the handle. It's then pushed gently down in place and I'll sometimes use a trimmer just to remove that smeared piece of clay if it's particularly bad. Otherwise I just use the smooth portion of a plastic kidney like this. If the stamps appear quite scruffy, I'll correct those two, and then once again I just push the pot down and spin the wheel. Just to make sure that the rim is nice and round, as they can be drawn off centre after the handling process. This final step doesn't take too long, just over an hour to finish the entire lot, and it makes such a world of difference to the quality of the pieces, as the bases of pots should never be forgotten about. I'm often asked whether creating big batches of pots like this gets dull. And whilst it is obviously repetitive, I love the process as there's something so satisfying about creating large batches of identical pots, especially when you see them en masse like this. All of those hours of hard work laid out in front of you. The next step for these 
we'll be bisque firing them, glazing them, and then reduction firing them. But I'll save that for a future video. I hope this film showed the reality of creating larger batches of work, and all the monotonous covering, uncovering, spraying with water, and monitoring the dryness of these pots. And that, more than anything, is both the most time-consuming and the most crucial aspect of creating larger batches of pots like this. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch, especially if you make it to the end. Let me know if you did. And as always, I'll see you next time.